I get so much street cred from my students. You can't imagine <laughs> the first day the freshmen come in the first day, if they don't know it already, I like, uh, I'll be your teacher for this class. I created Crocs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're just like, oh, 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 we're not worthy. Immediate, you know, immediate and, respect. A lot of squirrel voices. Yeah. yeah. A lot of impressions too. That's the other thing I get more than anything is a lot of people want to think they got the perfect Crocs, you know, and they're always, hey, wait a minute. You can't be the real, I mean, is that the poison? The poison for Cusco, the poison chosen especially to kill Cusco, that poison. And they, just, they want to come out with it. They want to come out with their cronk, you know. That's amazing. And they all think they got the perfect cronk. Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. Making stuff is hard, especially in the entertainment world, where big egos, bigger budgets, and just plain bad luck can make things go horribly wrong. And we're going behind the scenes of these disastrous, never-ending, and often dangerous productions to find out why it was a shit show. Hey, shitheads. That's right. That's what we're calling you now. Many of you have asked how to support the show, and we're excited to announce that we're now on Patreon. We have multiple tiers that give you access to longer director's cuts, our Discord community, DVD extras, bad movie night suggestions, a glimpse into Clint's closet, if you're into that kind of thing, and whatever other random shit we come up with. Check out the show notes for the link to Patreon if you want to join us. See you there! Hello, friends. This is It Was a Shit Show. My name's Ian. I'm joined by Ray, as always. Hello. And I have an incredibly special guest, Tony Bancroft. Say hello. hey <laughs> Hey, thanks for having me, Ray and Ian. It's glad to be here on the Beep Show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're so happy to have you here. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty crazy. Um, you've had quite the storied career uh, as an animator from Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, to your feature film di- directorial debut of Mulan alongside yeah. co-director Barry Cook. Um, and this is not to mention like all the other things you've done from Animal Crackers to your tons of shorts and and the series you've worked on. And apparently Cuphead? <laughs> yeah, that was a small little thing. I was going to say you're exhausting me just by rolling the credits. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Cuphead was very short. My bo- Both my twin brother, Tom Bancroft, and I worked on Cuphead for a little bit. It was kind of a... Not the first version of the video game, as people know it. They did a... Um, the DLC. Uh, a, a DLC, I thank you. Um, and so we contributed to the DLC. I, I heard later that they redid everything and changed the DLC direction altogether. So I think... I don't know that much of what we did is still in there or not, but... Yeah, that's pretty cool because, I mean, go, that's a whole... You film, TV, and video games. That's that's pretty cool. I know, I know. I wish there was an award like an EGOT or something for, <laughs> yeah. for animators. You know. <laughs> so, and then uh, speaking of your your brother, you guys also have a podcast. Uh, who is all? He is also an animator, and you guys' mm-hmm. his podcast is the aptly named the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. Yeah, we we just kind of blew the creative limit there with the title. We were like, uh, that's it. it. (laughs) I guess that's it. It's, you know, it's SEO appropriate. Yeah, I listened uh, to the episode you did on Studio Ghibli recently and and Miyazaki. Uh, I'm a huge Miyazaki fan. So it was really cool to hear you guys talk about that from an animation perspective and how much his work influenced the work that you were doing at Disney. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I recommend that to anybody that's Miyazaki fans. And, you know, Tom and I are kind of known for being, you know, 2D centric, of course, but also on top of that, uh, you know, more Western audience, I guess. We're not really into anime. People make fun of us all the time. Our students <laughs> in particular make fun of us for uh, kind of being anime haters. But when it comes to, um, you know, Japanese animation, or if you even put Hi- uh, Hayao Miyazaki in, in the category of, um, he seems so bu- above anime to me. I-, I hate to even put him in that category, but he's one of my all-time favorites when it comes to directors and just storytellers. I mean, I would get the same kind of hate for saying the same thing because I completely agree with what you just said. Anime, oh, anime. Ian. You just lost. You lost uh, listeners. Yeah, I they're, know. They're leaving. I know. There goes 10, 20, 30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. It's balanced out by the fact that I am an anime fan, but I also agree with you that I would not consider Miyazaki to be anime. So, 
Oh, okay. Well, Ray's the coolest. We've established that. Ray's the coolest in the room. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I could talk to you for days about all your other projects, um, but I, let's 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 stay focused. Um, and let's I thought center we, in. Yeah, let's yeah. center in on and just have an open, honest conversation about your time on Emperor's New Groove. Um, totally. And, uh, Good. I, I love behind the scenes stories. So. Um, so feel free to be honest and candid as you want. Absolutely. I, you know, I'm not a Disney employee anymore, so I can say what, whatever the heck All I right. want. Yeah. All yes. right. <laughs> um, okay. So as a quick recap, uh, Roger Allers, co-director of Lion King, was set to make Kingdom of the Sun, a grand epic set in Incan culture. In Allers' own words, he thinks he had too many ideas that weren't cohesive enough for the executives at Disney. After several years of development, Disney chose Mark Dindle to overhaul the entire film, which became what we know now as Emperor's New Groove. Mm. In this new version came the character of Kronk, the lovable henchman voiced by Patrick Warburton. And the supervising animator for Kronk was none other than you, Tony Bancroft. Yeah. Honor. It was an honor and a privilege to serve. Yes. <laughs> no, no, that was one of the, it, it was kind of the, you know, worst of times, best of times kind of moment in my life, I guess. But mostly best. Uh, you know, it was such a, from day one, just a fun production, just you wouldn't have known we were stressed out and under a, a big deadline. A big deadline because it, it was, but I didn't feel that so much. I felt it more on other productions, but this one was just like, "Hey, can we just you know ramp up the fun quality here every day by 10? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was right. Like that. I I mean, uh, we'll get into the like the documentary, but I uh, it, it definitely seemed that way. Like mm. there was there was a, a creative drive in there that was just freeing and a lot of fun. Um, so first off, you were you were not part of the original Kingdom of the Sun team, correct? No, no, I wasn't. I was um, busy. I was probably yeah. I was in Florida for most of the pre production on that film um, when it was under Rogers, um, you know, control, and it was um, Kingdom of the Sun, and there was a couple other titles too. I think that they kicked around. But yeah, I just was in Florida. I was working on Mulan, um, co-directing that. So um, I kind of had a lot going on, <laughs> but uh, but I did kind of follow it. You know, I mean, it was definitely part of our our, um, our world and our vision because it was it was um, you know even though it was being done in California and we were in Florida working on our own film, it was all Disney. So you, you tend to keep up with all that stuff. And we, I think we got to see. Um, if I remember right, we were watching dailies too from all the different productions that were going on at the same time. They let they the Disney Studios tends to let you watch kind of everything that's going mm. on. So even though we didn't have dailies, tended not to have sound from what I remember, um, or did it? No, I think it did. Um, but yeah, we would see a lot of the dailies and just be cracking up going, I, I don't know how this works into a movie because we're all seeing separate <laughs> scenes from all over and stuff by different animators. Uh, but we're like, oh, this is wild. <laughs> so even before the the revisioning, it was still kind of like, huh, what is this about? Yeah, what's what what pulls it all together? Yeah. So, yeah. so you didn't see like an unfinished version like like a front No, we to did. Back. So so that was the first uh, the, the first time I saw it was in dailies and I was just seeing pieces and we were trying to kind of figure it out. And there wasn't a lot of animation being done at the time at that time. So there wasn't a lot of long dailies for uh, Empire. What is it? Kingdom of the Sun. <laughs> Kingdom of the Sun. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that was just our first introduction. But then it was also the tradition for the directors to bring. They, they never knew if they were going to need more help on these films. So and since the Florida studio had a grand tradition, not one that we loved, but of kind of being the helper studio for the mm -hmm. main studio in, in the Burbank studio where, where the main films were being done. We would often be pulled in to work on a sequence or something. So they wanted to keep us up to date. And so um, Roger Allers and I think Mark Dindle was attached to it then, too, even though Roger was the main director and definitely Mark was a co-director. Um, they brought it down to Florida and kind of pitched it, you know, Roger talking about his vision and then screen the animatic for us. So we, we got to see the first pass and it might've been a second pass to tell you the truth of the animatic that Roger was developing. What did you think of it? Oh, what didn't I think? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what? We were, we were very high 
for it, uh, the whole Florida team. So we were super excited. Roger, of course, great reputation. I've always had a lot of admiration, still do, for Roger Allers as a director, as a creator. As uh, I knew him first as a storyboard artist on Beauty and the Beast. He was kind of the head of story on that. Um, I think he was the head of story. And then um, went into directing, of course, on Lion King, knocked it out of the park with uh, Rob Minkoff as his co-director. Um, and I worked under him on that. And he was always so generous and giving and just a just a wonderful guy and such a great artist too. Mm -hmm. This, he was just, it, it was obvious from the from the, the moment the reels started turning on the projector that I felt like he just had too much of him, uh, of only his own ideas up there and there just wasn't enough sharing and, and working with other people. I felt like hmm. he was really holding on. I think, and this is between us and everybody that's listening. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> You know, Rob and Roger were very competitive on The Lion King. Um, yeah. Roger started with it. Rob came on as the second director. I know this feeling because I was the second director on Mulan and Barry Cook gave me a hard time um, when I first came on. He was not happy to, um, and he would admit this too, share, yeah, share the co-directing, um, the d directing duties. But uh, for, for Roger, he wanted this to be his moment to shine, I think, as a single director. And so, um, you know, even bringing on Mark, who came later after there started to be some issues um, with the story, you know, he was not excited about that. I don't think that was his choice. But at, at the time, it was just totally kind of his vision. And I th and it was just very derivative. That was my first instinct. Hmm. Uh, my first feeling about it was that it felt like so many other kind of classic Disney films, hmm. uh, particularly Prince and the Popper, that yeah. story, and um, Aladdin. It felt like Aladdin and Prince and the Popper, Popper just, you know, had a creative baby and, you know, and they crapped out that film. Um, at least from the animatics that we saw, um, there was a lot of that. Roger had kind of hired a bunch of the same storyboard artists that he had, uh, that he'd worked with on Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. So, um, yeah, it, it just um, didn't feel unique. It did have um, some of the cast in it. Of course, Patrick Warburton came later, so he yeah. was not part of it. But, you know, Yzma was still uh, voiced by... Um, Eartha Kitt. Um, yeah, Eartha Kitt, thank you. And and to have David Spade in there uh, as his voice. I was always a David Spade fan, so uh, there mm -hmm. was kind of... Even though he's a very harsh character, and he was playing both sides, he was playing the prince and popper role. So yeah. there was kind of this caustic side that kind of stayed. Actually, that that caustic David Spade character was the one that they kind of took into the next uh, iteration of the film. But then there was like this kinder, gentler guy that wanted to be, you know, romance, find romance and stuff. And he was the the popper. I guess he was the popper one, the kinder, gentler one. Then there was this whole love story that was all in there. It was very convoluted and more than anything, you went away with it going, that didn't seem special. I mean, just, it's almost hmm. like they took Prince and the Popper and threw it in Peru. Right. It's interesting that you mentioned that the, it seemed like every idea was just the, the directors and there wasn't enough collaboration because it seems like in live action filmmaking that that is always heralded as a good thing, right? Like a singular vision of an auteur director is always like what people look for in, in films, but like in animation, is that different? Like is collaboration more valued? Yeah, it, it's certain the auteur kind of directing style certainly isn't the norm in animation. It does mm. happen and, and oftentimes to good effect, but more on the independent side and kind of the artsy fartsy type movies, the bigger commercial stories where you want to get a universal uh, connection from your audience that it'll play kind of all over the world is really more dependent on, um, uh, uh, more of a collaboration for sure. There's always, there tends to always be two directors. Mm. There tends to be a large involvement of not only, not only a series of screenwriters and this one boy had a bunch too. Um, and then also a, a large story team too, that, that is really listened to. And it's kind of the Disney feature animation culture to kind of let anybody and everybody have a voice up to a mm -hmm. certain degree like the janitor could really come in and see the screening <laughs> and, and give notes. And, you know, they, 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 they might not have the same weight for the directors for whatever reason, um, but they read all the notes. I know this from yeah. Mulan because every time we had a screening, I got in-betweeners giving me notes. I get, you know, art directors giving me notes and all the way down, 
you know, to color artists or something like that, that um, I normally would not hear from whatsoever or didn't even know their names. They didn't know my name. And yet they had a lot of opinions on <laughs> where the movie should go. Um, so um, and then on top of it, the executives, of course, throw in and they're the ones that you're like, oh, I've got to listen to those. Um, and then you try and find creative ways not to do that. Right. <laughs> so at one point, um, Disney wanted to like hear the differing opinions, as as you mentioned, other people weighing in on on this particular project. And then Mark Dindle and Chris Williams pitched like a much more comedic film. And then Disney split them into two different crews, one under Roger Allers to kind of fine tune his version, and then Mark Dindle to flesh out his his take. Um, yeah. And then so basically what um, uh, executive producer Don Hahn called a bake off. Um, mm. and what are your thoughts on, on this bake off and as, a, as a practice in general and this, the decision to do it under that production? I mean, I could see how when it was probably first now, I, this is when, before I was on the film, so I don't have firsthand impressions by hearing Roger or, or, um, Mark Dinnell talk about it too much. Um, I know that Roger was. I, because I've heard this through the grapevine that he was not happy about this Bake Off thing. He felt like, you know, I mean, let's face it. He came off of Lion King, all time, big success. He was the golden boy. Yeah. Um, his feeling is like, what do I got to do? I got to prove myself hmm. again. Lion yeah. King wasn't enough for you. Let me just have my way. Um, but they kept quite, they, and they did give him a lot of rope. I will say that I think because of Lion King and the success of it, I think he had, they kept kind of give him a longer leash. Okay, we're not sure about this, but mm -hmm. keep going. You're Roger Ellers. Um, you know, and they, he was one of the golden boys at the time. And he was, and Roger's always been very good. He's, he's a story expert. He came from storyboarding and was always like, you know, like I said, head of story on different projects, including Beauty and the Beast, which was a, you know, a, a, you know, mostly about the story is why it was so successful, that and the music. So, um, he had, you know, he had a lot of weight. Um, and Mark, who was brought on because he did, you know, Cats Don't Dance. He he directed that project over at Warner Brothers. So um, Mark Dindel had been trying to do some more directing and, and wanted to speak into this. And I think they just called him up because he started at Disney. Mark, yeah. Mark had a lot of Disney roots. And so uh, uh, Don Hahn was very familiar with them and Randy Fulmer was good friends with them. So I think it was Randy that called him in and just started asking his two cents on, you know, showed him the picture and got his two cents on it. And they really liked what Mark Mark's ideas were. They liked where he wanted to take it. And he had it, you know, he had a younger and more comic um, uh, look at it. And in the screenings, as I saw too, uh, when I was telling you about the Florida screening, it was just kind of dying there. It was like transitions weren't working. Things were mm -hmm. awkward. Um, there was just a sense of straightness and dryness to it that it needed some life. It needed some humor. Mm -hmm. um, so the Bake Off came about because Mark started, and I can't really say enough about Chris Williams' um, part in all this. Chris Williams was a storyboard artist with Roger since the beginning. And I worked with them on Mulan before that. And so I know Chris very well. And what he brings is spontaneity, life, humor, big yeah. humor. Um, he's just nutty, crazy. And that comes through in his boards. And he's worked on a lot of different productions where he's brought that to, um, uh, to the, to the movies that he's worked on and, and now doing a great job as a director over at Netflix. So um, he, uh, and he's up for, an Oscar right now it has it announced today. Um, oh, I didn't see that. Oh, wow. The Sea Beast is a, a film that Chris Williams directed for Netflix and it's up for Oscar nomination. Cool. Amazing. Best animated feature. Um, but Chris, being a storyboard artist, had a lot of freedom just to try things. And that's really when, you know, if, if you give Chris that kind of creative rope, he just goes nuts with it and, and the best stuff comes out of it. Some stuff you can't use, obviously, but, um, and he was very influenced by Chris Sanders before him, um, who was also kind of a nutty, crazy, you know, storyboard guy that would just have all kinds of wild ideas. But Chris Williams, uh, working with Mark Dindle, and Mark was attracted to Chris almost immediately. So they started becoming a duo a little bit, kind of in the hallways, pitching ideas and 
and then and Mark was always the biggest laugher at Chris's ideas on the on the boards. Whereas I think Roger was always just like, hmm, I don't know. Well, that's pretty <laughs> good, but hmm, not I what I know. wanted. Yeah. 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 Can we have a, can we make it more serious? Maybe. <laughs> was it, pondering. was it common to do this kind of stuff to kind of split them into teams like that? No, 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 it wasn't. So that's why I'm sure Roger Allers was um, not happy when Mark came in. Now, Roger, you wouldn't know it. He's such a sweet guy and, mm-hmm. and he, and, you know, and he really does collaborate with other people well, and he's very giving and all that. But this was a different story. This was his baby. He started the project from scratch. I think he pitched it and you know sold sold the studio on it. So this was his baby. So it it must have hurt to have the studio go. You know, we've been telling you for a while now. This is kind of straight and dull and derivative. Now we're going to bring in this guy Mark Dindle, who you know he they did know each other beforehand um, and had worked on other productions probably. So, um, but. <laughs> You know, anytime something like that, that's that's obviously, you know, red flag number one for Roger Allers is going, yeah. oh, they're they're forcing me to work with somebody else now. Mm. But Roger, I'm sure, made sure that that everybody knew that Mark Dindle was a co-director, <laughs> not a <laughs> not a we're not both co-directors yeah. working as a team. I'm the director. He's the co-director. That was definitely how it was explained when I came on board, too. Uh. For Well, actually, when I came on board. Roger was already out, but that's what I had heard from so many. So the the final word comes down. Allers' film is out, and Dindle is given full control. And then Roger yeah. Allers just chose not to not to continue with the project. Um, he jumped onto Lilo and Stitch um, through the overhaul. Kronk was introduced, which has to be one of the most enduring like characters Disney's <laughs> has ever created. Like the level of the memes and uh, yeah. just the love that people have for that one particular character is kind of insane. How did it you is. get that assignment? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> and you know, and, and if I had a crystal ball, of course, at that time, it would have been an easy choice, but I, it did come down to a choice actually where I came off of Mulan and Mulan was a, a pretty good success for the studio. So, um, and I also kind of I was I went into development for about six months. So right after Mulan, I went upstairs to the development department and kind of was sitting around with not much to do. And they were just kind of like, well, you know, I, I kept asking like Tom Schumacher, who was then the vice president of development. And I'm like, Tom, when my do you have a project for me? Am I <laughs> supposed to pitch you ideas? How does this work? I've never, you know, come off of a film and had this time now. And they're like, yeah, just take it easy, but you know, do some research, start kicking things around, and as you're ready, you can pitch us some ideas. But there was no sense of uh, hurry at all mm-hmm. or time, and um, and I and it was because I started looking around, going, realizing that oh, there's this director group over here or this director over here, and they're developing something. They've been doing that for two years now, and they're ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> so how long am I going to be sitting up here yeah. in development, kicking around ideas? proposing I I, th- I felt like there was the runway was full there yeah. was already you know pictures planning to take off right um, and about five or six of them I think ahead of me and I started realizing this could be I could have another film out in eight years maybe ten years I mean this could be a long way down the road and I felt like the clock started ticking in me and I got really anxious about it. And I missed animating. I, I tried to do, I, I animated four shots in Mulan because I just had to, you know, put pencil to paper again. And uh, yeah, I just, I missed it so much. I love drawing. I love animating. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got in the trenches a little bit, even though I had no time in my schedule for that. But <laughs> I just selfishly was like, I want to do that scene. I want to do that scene. Let me just, let me, you know, in the, I'll stay late tonight and I'll work out, you know. And they're like, oh, you're crazy. Um, and so I asked at that point, that's when I went to Tom Schumacher and said, can I, can I go just help out a production for a while? It feels mm-hmm. like I'm going to, I have all the time in the world. And I pitched, I pitched three or four ideas to Tom Schumacher all things that I thought were really good ideas. I pitched Puss in Boots as a feature. Oh, oh Got turned down. Wow. <laughs> literally, literally turned down because of the title. Tom Schumacher <laughs> said, 
course. We will never be able to make a film at Disney called Puss in Boots. <laughs> I said, if you put a if you put a cat in boots on the poster, <laughs> yeah, why would anybody think anything yeah, else? He's right. like, nope, it's pornographic. <laughs> <laughs> It'll always be. Uh, all right, all right. So that was one. I pitched the superhero movie. This is before The Incredibles. I said we should have Disney should do their own superhero movie. It would be awesome. No, no, no. We're not interested in superheroes. And then, you know, years later, they bought Marvel yeah. and they made in The Incredibles <laughs> even before that. Um, and then I pitched um, a giant film that took place in Ireland, a very I uh, uh, Irish kind of folktale thing. And then they said, no, 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 no. The only people interested in Irish folktales are, are drunk Irishmen. <laughs> So I, I started seeing after every yeah. single pitch and, and all these things of, you know, Brave, they made Brave later, which was very Irish. It wasn't about giants. And then they had another film that was about giants in production for a long time. But all these things that I had pitched were falling flat and mm -hmm. I could tell they were mm -hmm. not in a hurry to approve anything, to get here any new ideas. They really didn't care. And this was raw, right on the cusp. Um, and, and not that I had a crystal ball or anything, but soon after this everything turned cg and they got rid of their 2d department altogether there was a huge overhaul and i left uh, uh before all that and that was after emperor's new groove but i started going okay this i'm going to be in development for a long time i'd rather go help out a picture so i asked him what was available and he said there's two films right now that are going into animation treasure planet and mm -hmm. this new one now is being called emperor's new groove and i you know i'd heard about both of course treasure planet had uh, you know, a striking record. People were really excited by it because it was Ron and John, the two directors that had done Little Mermaid and so many other things. Um, and it was, you know, space and it was kind of sci-fi and that was kind of the first for, for Disney. And they had this, I I'm a comedy guy. I've always done like, um, you know, Kronk, Yago, yeah. um, Pumbaa. So I I've always done comedy characters. Um, typecast, but I love it. I, I, that's what I prefer <laughs> doing. And uh, so I said, well, is, are there comedy characters on these? And they were like, yeah, there's Morph on Treasure Planet, which is that little ambiguous morphy uh, creature mm -hmm. that can change into mm -hmm. things. Or there's there's this new character, Kronk, on Emperor's New Groove. And he's kind of this dumb boy toy to Yzma, henchman kind of guy. <laughs> and uh, Patrick Warburton does the voice. And I was like, oh, wait, Patrick Warburton, that's the guy... Putty from Seinfeld. <laughs> that was all he was known for at yeah. the time, yes. is that he was uh, Elaine's boyfriend, Putty, on Seinfeld. But he was a scene stealer, even on Seinfeld, as funny as that was. Um, and so I knew who he was. And then I heard a, a, an audition that he had done for the character. And I just said, oh, I got to do that. It was mm. all based on Patrick Warburton. Yeah. Like, yeah, of there was course. Nothing else. So, yeah, that's how I, I I got a choice and I and I thankfully picked right. So, OK, going into the production, there were a lot of ideas like thrown out. Uh, Mark Dindle and Chris Williams and uh, David Reynolds, they, all, they talk about like they came up with all these ideas such as like Adam West recruiting like an army of scarecrows and and, and yeah. wacky stuff. And, and they were kind of seeing how far they could push the boundary by uh, putting real footage of a rocket launch in there. Um, yeah. How many of those ideas were you involved with and how far along did they get into the animation process before they were tossed? Um, they didn't last long um, okay. I, because I think they they did once they got kind of the go ahead and the green light there. That was early on kind of let's see where those boundaries lie, just like you were saying. Let's see how far we can go with some of this. And then there was as much as Peter and Tom, the, the, the big bosses, were like, oh, we love this new comic we're, direction you're going. And then they gave him some leash and then they pulled back that leash and said, uh, this is too much. You know, this is too zany. <laughs> this is still a Disney feature animation movie. You know, it's not a Warner Brothers cartoon. Yeah. So um, they so by the time I came on, which was soon after the change, um, I will say um, probably within the six months mark or something, maybe even four months after the change happened. Um, that those ideas were not in the, any of the first screenings I saw. Hmm. I had heard of them, hmm. and I think I even saw boards around for the Adam West character. That that's the one that stuck around the most. I mean, I think there was Mark was super excited about that, and he really wanted to work with Adam West, and 
they recorded him and and did some you know did some iterations i think on some of those sequences and his character but ultimately the cavalcade of story geniuses talked him out of it i think and said you know it's not really it's not really helping move the story forward it's kind of a distraction it feels very you know yeah. off to the side so it, it was a good choice because i mean but you know some of the stuff that stuck that you could say are, is in that same category is you know bucky the squirrel <laughs> making <laughs> balloon animals, balloon animals yeah. and um you know there's still plenty of gags in there and things like that but they're usually cutaways they're usually just one-offs like the trampoline yeah. gag right and, you know um I, you know it's just kind of one-offs but when you have a whole sequence devoted to one-offs and and a, and a character that really doesn't propel the story it's it's usually got to go so that th- it was much more focused like what w- by the time you got on yeah it had to be every meeting it was kind of a reminder of like okay so today we're going to work out this sequence <laughs> you know it's like we're going to get this work in so um you know there was always a sense of we can't fiddle around too much yeah. um and so that's why i think mark and chris williams and david reynolds i'm glad you mentioned him as a He's a great comedy writer, and he's very, he was very valuable in that. So that was kind of the threesome. That was the that was the mastermind brain, you know, uh, brainchild, if you will, uh, of Emperor's New Groove was those three together: Mark Dindal, Chris Williams as a storyboard artist, and then uh, David Reynolds as a writer. So you, you kind of had a trifecta there of comedy genius. And Mark was really great at knowing, you know, having gone through w- what Roger had gone through, at least the tail end of his experience, he knew what, you know, his bosses wanted. Hmm. Um, he knew what Disney, and he, he was a Disney employee for years before that. So he knew what, what a Disney film should be too. And, and so he had to give it a little bit of that classical heart to it. And he was good at that. Whereas Dave and Chris were the ones that were always the big jokesters pushing things to the utmost. And then Mark was the, thankfully, was the controlling one that (laughs) that had the most say to say, to veto some of that weird stuff in favor of, well, it's got to be, it's got to have some heart to it. It's got to be feel real. We got to like these characters, guys. You know, they can't just be, you know, caustic humor all the time. Yeah. The the Three Stooges, you know. Yeah. That's such a careful balance that you have to strike of heart and then good comedic gags and then things that don't distract and push the story forward, like you mentioned. And I think that's one of the reasons why people love Emperor's. That's why I love Emperor's New Groove so much and why it's it's been such a lasting uh, movie is because it just balances those things so well. Like you said, like those little visual gags of like Bucky the Squirrel and like the the whole, you know, pull the lever, Kronk, and all of the stuff with Kronk and Yzma is just, it's so funny, but it doesn't feel like a distraction from the main story. It just adds to the, no. the whole movie. It adds. And you're right. I mean, you hit it on the nose, Ray. It's, it is so hard to do to create balance like that, um, particularly in the world of a Disney feature where, where people have such expectations, I think, of where the story's going to go, or, or at least the tone and feel of it. This had, this was... I mean, out of all, you know, the canon of Disney features, I think hands down, it's the most zany, weird, For sure. off the cuff oh, yeah. kind of movie that's ever been made by Disney. And I'm super proud to have been a part of it because of that. But in, in the same respect, like you said, it's it's still got a lot of charm. There's still a real core story there that that you care about and you do care for these characters. Now, a lot of people blame, I've heard this for many years, a lot of people blame the lack of success. When it first came out, it, the, the movie did not do well. Right. Um, I, I blame, I tend to blame the marketing. They didn't yeah. know how to market it. They didn't know what to do with it. I, I think there was a lot of confusion about what they what they had given birth to. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's like, what is this? Yeah. Um, oh, you man. know, and um, so I blame kind of the, the team around the film didn't know what to do with it, didn't know what kind of the jewel that they had and and i i do think it was kind of ahead of its time in a lot of respects too like i think that's why it's so popular now um but but on top of it i think there was just a a sense of like you know does it have enough is it is it a disney film you know does this really fit in the canon at all and Mm -hmm. there was probably even debate about whether it should be released once it was done but they you know they put so much time and money in it I think they wanted to see they can get something back. Yeah, after all the, the all the delays and yeah. So, um, speaking of that, like kind of like the time crunch of it all, 
Um, so uh, David Reynolds said in the previous films that he'd worked on, everything was kind of focus grouped in a way um, to like no end at Disney. But Emperor's New Groove was like, there was no time for that. And so yeah. there was just little oversight from the from Disney executives. And did it did it feel that way? Like compared oh, to, yeah. like, to Mulan? Yeah. And and it was the hidden reward of of screwing up for so long was that, <laughs> you know, mom and dad had to kind of just let you get your cl room clean, you know, because the <laughs> guests are coming. Yeah. Um, and they couldn't, you know, check it out and oversee it, the process. And. And we, the kids, kind of had carte blanche to to try things and push things and stuff like that. And it was so. Uh, and, and again, I applaud Mark Dindle as the director of the film because he had to be the sensical one and also be so, totally nonsensical uh, in trying new things and stuff. And he created the balance. And and the and our big bosses, uh, Peter and Tom, you know, the executives in charge. I don't think they, you know, had a lot of control over it because of the time, the ticking clock and stuff. But I think they had to they had to just really give their faith over to Mark Dindle. And I do credit them for that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's got to be hard for any executive that's used to getting into the minutia and feeling like they helped make this movie and all this kind of stuff. But it was I've always felt like. You know, it's the renegades, it's the uh, projects that have as little oversight as possible that have been the successful ones. You know, Lion King was the the B movie. You've heard this story, yeah. right, about Lion King. You know, Pocahontas was the one that got, got all the attention and, and the studio thought that was gonna be their big money maker. So it got a lot more executive attention therefore mm. too. Um, whereas Lion, Lion King, they, they were able to try new things and go kind of a little wild because the studio's like, eh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Mulan was the same thing. We were, it was the first feature done in, in the Florida studio. They didn't know how to kind of, there wasn't great communication a lot of times because we were so far away. It was just pre zoom and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. We, we had a satellite connection, but it was very expensive and, uh, they didn't like to use it <laughs> very much. <laughs> and they didn't want to get on a plane and fly out to Florida all the time to see what we were doing. So we got a lot more or a lot less supervision corporately. And, and I feel like the, the movie did well because of that and Emperor's New Groove. So I, I love working on kind of the the bastard child projects <laughs> yeah. of, of Disney. <laughs> I've got to work on Lion King, Mulan and Emperor's New Groove. And it's been um, to the benefit of those films and really helped make my career. I just yeah. feel privileged. That's For sure. Like that. So you preferred it that way, like that kind of. Lack oh yeah, and at the time I was too stupid to really see that as a pattern. <laughs> it, you know, it's twenty twenty hindsight where I look back and I go, "Oh, well, of course, that's why because <laughs> the studio didn't care about these projects. They didn't give it the same oversight. They didn't scrutinize. They didn't get in there and mess with it. You know, yeah, check the recipe for sure. And when you jumped on the the, the overhaul, do you feel like there was um, like a complete change in the morale of the team? before and after the 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 change well yeah i mean and there was there was it wasn't just roger that left the project too there were some some of the animators that had more power and say like andrea stasia yes. in particular who was he was our one big superstar that was on that film um and he decided to leave the film when roger did so he had an allegiance to what roger was making mm -hmm. and he could this wacky weird thing that was coming up was like I don't see that. That's not me. I don't want to be a part of it. If you've seen the documentary yeah. about the movie, you know that Sting was not on board either. Yeah. He wanted to be attached to the one that he had worked the most on. And he stayed on, I think contractually, his agent or something talked him into it. But he was not real gung-ho about the second one. I remember seeing Sting at the rap party and he's just kind of off in the corner and <laughs> <laughs> just did not look happy, did not look happy. And that was after we saw the movie. But I think all he could think about was his cut songs. I think that's all yeah. he ever saw after a certain point was like. <sighs> why why did I spend all my time on that? Yeah. And he wasn't used to that. He wasn't used yeah. to people going, uh, thank you for all those songs. We're not going to use them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, even I mean it's that, Sting, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so, so there was there was quite a few, and it wasn't just Andreas. But to answer your question, there was there was definitely a changeover that happened, and some people stayed, and some most people stayed, uh, and then we got some new people like myself uh, that joined. Um, but 
we were we got solid really quickly i would say the Mm -hmm. people that stayed and the crew that was on the the new iteration we were happy with the change we were gung-ho to make it happen and we just decided let's let's go all in and have fun yeah for sure it really it really was yeah and you can tell you can you can see it on the screen and yeah it shows on the screen for sure So it sounds like even though there was some stress and some crunch and a lot of things being thrown out and and sort of flying by the seat of your pants, sometimes it was the more fun, like you said, renegade project to work on because it was. (laughs) Yeah, there was a lot of yes going on. You know, know, it felt like fun, like good improv. Yes, and, you know, like (laughs) so. And before that, I feel like everything was like. Um, I don't know about that idea. Mm. Let's kick it around. We'll try it. We'll see if it sticks and whatever. This is more like, um, oh, you laughed. Okay, let's put it in the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So, so the first screening uh, for the executives, uh, Randy Fulmer, the producer, said that he had never experienced such a successful screening in his career. Like it, it was yeah. just, he came out of it and it was like, wow, we got Peter and Tom, uh, the the executives were kind of like, well, awesome, keep going. Like what was yeah. what was that like, kind of like that moment where you're like, what notes were you given? Yeah, I, I wasn't in that screening or in the, the after meeting. Um, uh, so I've only heard about that through the documentary and stuff. I think I came in right after that, to oh, tell okay. you the truth, right after, right after they had that successful screening. So I heard about it. Um, there was just a sense of relief. And I think if it wasn't for that positivity coming out of that screening, I think there would have been a lot more doubts about which we were going and rethinking things and a lot more no's and stuff that would have happened. Mm-hmm. That screening had to happen for that movie to be made in that amount of time. Mm. That started the... Yes, and that started the snowball. Let's have fun. This started the, you know, we're going, you know, and just big smiles all the way to the finish line. And it gave the energy that we needed. It gave the positivity to the project that that's that needed to happen. If there was only like a halfway, uh, it's a good start. Let's keep it might have been boy, axed. I, I, it might have been axed. It might have uh it languished too much and been overthought. You know, we needed that like, okay, let's make this by the seat of the pants, uh, <laughs> our seat of our pants, but but also, you know, give us carte blanche. We just need to go. And boy, if it wasn't for that, there wouldn't have been uh, Emperor's New Groove like we know it now. I'm sure of it. That's, yeah, amazing. That's awesome. Um, well, okay, going back to Sting. So Sting was writing several songs. My favorite chap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so he wrote, he was writing several songs for the film, uh, and his wife, Trudy Styler, uh, along with yeah. John uh, Paul Davidson, um, they were making a documentary about the the whole process. And from their film, The Sweatbox, it seemed like everyone was very open to discuss their process and very kind of like what was kind of, I wouldn't say secretive, but it just not very many people saw the inside of what Disney Animation was doing. And- you make an appearance uh, reenacting mm. Patrick Warburton's mannerisms into a mirror um, while animating Crunk. How <laughs> did you feel about like someone sitting there with a camera, like just showing how you do stuff like that? Well, I mean, I had just done Mulan and gone through a lot of press and stuff. I also did a lot of press uh, for Puma and Timon on Lion King when that came out was a big success, and, and you know, and worked on those scene stillers. So. Um, I was used to um, cameras and the press being around. I'm kind of a ham anyway. <laughs> um, I like when a microphone's in front of me. <laughs> My precious. <laughs> um, but that aside, I, I um, going back, to, uh, and, I, and I appreciate you bringing up the documentary because I think the documentary is is and always was so important to Emperor's New Groove. I'm so glad it was made. Hmm. And the story behind that that I know about is that when Sting came on board, he wanted to give Trudy something to do and and see if they could make a little bit more money in the family, I think. So um, he was the one that really pushed. And like I think it was part of his contract that his wife got to do a documentary. She was into documentaries at the time, uh, doing a lot of stuff there. And um, they both thought it was a really great idea. So they sold Disney on the idea. Disney, I don't think, ever would have done that nor wanted to do that mm, if yeah. it wasn't for Sting really pushing for that a- in his contract, I mean, up front. And so huh. she had, um, from what I understand, she had carte blanche, her and her team, 
They were privy to every week's schedule. They knew what was coming up months in advance, when the screenings were, when, um, and Randy would, you know, focus them in on story meetings that were going to be important or, or, a, or a song pitch or something like that. And so Trudy was able to have advance notice and they were just very involved. You wouldn't be surprised at, you know, oh, next week the film crew is going to be here. Oh, okay. You know, oh, that's cool. And they started getting a real relationship. Now, one thing I will say is Trudy gets a lot of credit for this, but that movie was directed and pr- and really put together by, um, you mentioned his name and now I forgot it. John, John Paul Davidson. John Paul Davidson. He was the one that was there. Hmm. It wasn't Trudy walking around with a camera and a microphone or anything like that. We saw her very rarely. She would only show up for the sessions where Sting was going to be there or if it was a really big screening with all the executives, Michael Eisner was in the room. Mm-hmm. She would show up for that. Yeah. Interesting. She was not there. She was not there day to day. It was all uh, John Paul and um, and he really put that movie together. I really feel like I think she just spoke into it here and there and 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 helped get hmm. Sting in there. It, it became the kind of the Sting documentary. Yeah, I mean, anyway. yeah, I mean, he's definitely the I main really character like he, of it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the whole process through Sting's eyes. It's not through <laughs> the animator's eyes as much, you know. We're, we're lucky to be in there at all, to tell the truth, not not hitting a bongo in the background or something. But but I do love that. I remember seeing that uh, the sweat box um, and I was honored to be in it once once uh, I was cast on Kronk. And that was very early on, like I had just mm. animated one or two scenes hmm. when, when I'm on camera there. So I was still figuring him out in a large way. Mm. Um, so it was very early days for me. But um, when the movie came out, they they screened uh, Sweatbox for us once um, in the theater at Feature Animation, where we saw our dailies and stuff like that, and had a big screening of it, and then never heard anything about it after that. And but mm-hmm. having gone through the process of directing a film, I remember my first impression of the Sweatbox, which is why I tell people to watch it because I feel like there is a real truth and honesty to it mm-hmm. about re, you know pulling back the curtains and the kind of access that John Paul had and and Trudy um, in in doing that was never before and never done again because these were not Disney employees. They were trying to get a real story of, of how these movies get made. But the studio, I think it was Michael Eisner who saw it and said, oh, we can't release this. We got to bury this. You know, they did exactly what was contractual. I think it appeared in like one movie theater in LA, one movie theater in New York. It was all mm. about Academy consideration, yeah. but they did not want it up for Academy Award. They did not want it to be released in any larger way. So it was it was, it was was buried and, for, and now it's become folklore. You know, now it's just like animation folklore. People, you'll find it online every once in a while and then Disney will tear it yeah. down. Yeah, and why, why do you think that is? They're embarrassed by it. I mean, it, it, it shows very accurately and it, and it's not just Emperor's New Groove. You know, I think it's a very accurate portrayal of the creative process of making a Disney feature. Yeah. There's a lot of input. They go, because they have money and time, they're the biggest studio out there. They go in a lot of different directions. And and, and that needs to happen to get the kind of high quality that Pixar and Disney achieves in the storytelling. you got to take chances and you got to allow a lot of rope. Mm-hmm. So that same rope that Roger was given, and yeah, you can argue maybe it was too much uh, rope and for too long, is the same thing that makes Disney great. Mm. It really is. So, but you know, on the larger respect, they didn't want a lot of people, fans and stuff to go, oh my gosh, you spent millions and millions <laughs> of dollars for, for years, years making this movie in the wrong direction. What kind of idiots are you? Yeah to spend all that money and spend all that time. Why could, couldn't you have pulled it in a little bit sooner? You know, that was that was the part of the process they were embarrassed by mm. is that all the executives felt like they looked like bleeding idiots. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I mean, I completely understand their desire to want to bury something like that because it's a risk and it's vulnerable to let people inside the behind the scenes of the creative process because it's it's messy and it can be ugly. It's messy and ugly, but, you know, to, to Disney's credit, um, you know, and this is where so I, I just feel like some things need that. They need to be messy. Mm-hmm. They, uh, good things usually come from that. Um, you you look, you can judge other parents for how they raise their kids and, <laughs> you know, give them so much lease or let them watch too many video games. But those kids may still end up being Bill Gates or something. Mm-hmm, you know, right. they still may end up running this world or becoming president. You know, we we don't know. And <clears throat> and sometimes if it's not for that track, you won't get 
the greatness that could come out of something that's messy. Yeah. And there usually is great things that come out of messy because, uh, you know, that's how you learn what not to do, right. at least. I think it's empowering, too, for people who are interested in becoming animators or interested in, you know, embarking on a creative journey to see that, right? Because there's it's very intimidating. And if you just assume, like, oh, everyone is so perfect and knows what they're doing all the time, yeah. <laughs> then it's it, it's even more of a... A barrier of entry because you just assume you have to be that but it, but like sort of seeing how some people are like yeah you know we we just kind of figured it out as we went along and we collaborated and we were a team and like hey look what we made we made this amazing movie from that it's exactly right ray and i mean i think i see it all the time now with my students they the younger generation now i'm sounding like a, back in my day <laughs> no um but that you know the younger generation that i see out there getting an animation they, they tend to put people on pedestals mm, yeah. you know oh well you know you worked on lion king you must really know what you're doing and you're perfect and had the perfect career and you're wealthy whatever they assume and um none of that's true of course um but we struggled and and w we all did back then and and to now it's it's we didn't know what we were doing half the time we just knew what we liked, yeah. you know, mm. what was funny. And in that way, I tell my students, you're just like we were. You're exactly like we were. Really, all that, that you need to do is just work hard. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. You're going to get better at what you do. You're going to make mistakes. Allow yourself to learn from those mistakes and just try and get better all the time. That's all there is to it. Work hard and get better. Yeah, yeah I love that. So it's really rewarding now, though, and I'm sure this is a question you were building to, is it's really rewarding now for me to to say that I worked on this. And in some ways, to me, it's like, you know, Lion King, Mulan, Emperor's New Groove. Those those could be the only three films I worked on in my career, and I'd be proud just to talk about yeah. them. Oh, For that's sure. That's amazing. I must say, on my on my video that uh, about Emperor's yeah. New Groove, I must say that is the most positive comment section of anything that we have. And yeah. <laughs> and it is just flooded with people who just clearly love the movie just from just from their from pit their of their soul. And they yeah. were like, I can't believe it was cons like it went through all these troubles because I love it so much. They feel really bad for Allers and um, and also yeah. one day hope to see his version. Um, but there there's they don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll 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 never see the light of day. You don't think he'll um, come back to it, like through Netflix? No, or something? he doesn't. He doesn't. Well, see, that's the thing is that business wise, he doesn't own the rights mm. to that. Disney does. Disney put a lot of money into it. They own that material. It was all produced under their contracts and stuff. Yes, that's true. Everybody got paid, so there is no ability that Roger Ellis has to bring that back. Um, um, Unless he came into, you know, millions and millions of dollars and paid Disney those millions of dollars, uh, however unknown amount that is, and that's never going to happen. So um, there's no going back to that, and the studio's not obviously not proud of it, so there's no reason that they would make it. Yeah. Mm. The, the fan base for it is just really all just so high. And, I mean, like I said, Jenny Ray oh, is yeah. her favorite Huge film. Oh, yeah. Huge fan over here. Um, <laughs> but Love it. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> um, despite it failing financially, like everyone involved has said how passionate that fan base is. Like David Spade said, it's the only thing I ever got good reviews in. Um, and <laughs> and uh, a bunch of the people just say like that the people walk up and like that's the thing that they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Like how does it feel to be part of a cult classic? More than anything, what I get is you created my childhood. You know? <laughs> right. When pe when <laughs> students or people come up to me, because I have been a part of m multiple things like that. But I think I'm most proud of Emperor's New Groove in that respect, just because um, I so loved it mm -hmm. when I worked on it. I so enjoyed it and I wanted it to be successful. And when it wasn't, I was so yeah. hurt by that. Just personally, mm. I think we all were on the... On the crew, we, we worked so hard to get that film done in a short amount of time. We loved it like a child. And then it went out there and just had, uh, just flopped. And then to be here now, though, where it's getting so much good graces and love and respect and people are so influenced by it, it feels so good. It feels so rewarding to to just be here. And I, and I, I haven't had that mm -hmm. because most of the other films I worked on, they were Disney classics when they came out. They did well when they came out. They've always been successful and, you know, they just have a certain reverence that have always been consistent. This is the only one that, 
you know, started out as, um, you know, ugly and pimply <laughs> when it first came out and now it's turned into Brad Pitt. Uh, I, don't know what else to say. Yeah, I love that. And it's the Brad Pitt of Disney films. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, and it'll, and it'll go Amazing. on and, and on. I, I think we all look back at it, any, any of us that worked on it and said, man, I'm so happy I got a piece of that. <laughs> and for me personally, to, to claim, to be able to claim Kronk in particular, oh my gosh, I, I get so much street cred from my students. You can't imagine <laughs> the first day, the freshmen come in, the first day, if they don't know it already, I would like... Uh, hi, I'll be your teacher for this class. I created Kronk. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're just like, oh, ah, ah, we're not worthy. Immediate, you know, immediate and, respect. A lot of squirrel voices. Yeah. yeah. A lot of impressions too. That's the other thing I get more than anything is a lot of people want to think they got the perfect Kronk, you know, and they're always, they're always going, hey, wait a minute. You can't be the real, I mean, is that the poison? The poison for Cusco, the poison chosen especially to kill Cusco, that poison. And they, just, they want to come out with it. They want to come out with their cronk, you know. That's amazing. And they all think they got the perfect cronk. So whatever. Oh, so, I mean, this gets a little bit into the creation process. But, like, did you work really closely with Patrick? Like, did you watch his mannerisms? And, you know, Ian said in the documentary there was a, a moment where you were kind of pantomiming into a mirror the scenes to kind of get like the sense of the character down. Or how, what was that like working directly with him in, during the animation process? Well, like every film, animators, uh, especially the supervising animators, which is what I was on Kronk, you, you're invited, the directors invite you to all the recording sessions. Mm. So I was a part of all the recording uh, uh, sessions, um, started get, uh, kind of really fostered a relationship with uh, Patrick outside of the recording sessions too but but mostly that's when i saw him i mean you know they they come in every six months or so they they're there for four hours and record their lines or so and then you don't see him again for a while mm -hmm. so it's it, i can't say that he was influential for you know on an ongoing basis because we had a relationship but um we did videotape him i did drawings of him in the um the sessions uh and and so i would say yes there was a lot of study. The thing that I think is the misnomer about that kind of thing, you know, how much we get from the voice actors, animators, is that we only have those sessions. And in those sessions, they're, they got to be right in front of the mic. You know, just like I'm trying to trying to be for this podcast. You got to kind of be pointing your face right at the mic. There's not a lot of chance. You can get some hand gestures mm. that come into the frame of the of the video camera. You know, and maybe you see some cool expressions or bits of head tilts and stuff like that. But they're not free. They're not free to perform visually like they would if it was, you know, on camera and, and that sort of thing. They're They're really specifically thinking about their concentration of being in front of that mic. So you're not getting a full visual performance from the actors because they're they're professional. They're trying to do a good job to yeah. be on mic. Right. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation uh, for such an awesome movie that I, I didn't grow up on on Emperor's New Groove. I It was only after I started dating her that I, like, yeah, she showed it to me. I introduced him. Wow. I kind of moved on from animation. That's a good yeah. wife. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, exactly. a, that's a good wife. She's a keeper. Right? <laughs> thank, <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> I, I think you guys got to keep it going. I think there's still more stories to be oh, told. And I think you need to get Roger Allers. Ooh. Ooh. That oh, would be cool. I've never, I've never ever heard him talk about, besides the, you know, the documentary yeah. that originally happened. I've never, you know, and years have passed. So maybe uh, the stories are better, more bitter <laughs> or sweeter. I don't know. Well, you, know, you ought to put in a good word for us. Uh, let let yeah. Roger know we're interested. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because um, this, this stuff is very fascinating to me. I, yeah, I like I love this it. stuff so interesting. Well, if you don't get him, we're going to get him on the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. Please check yes. it out, you guys. It's available on <laughs> iTunes, of course, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Yeah, it's a great podcast. If you like animation, Like, go give it a listen. Well, that um, was a perfect plug. Or twins. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else that you are working on right now that you, or that you worked on recently that really is that you want people to know about? I mean, I did work on, you know, I love 2D animation. So um, I, I don't even really direct as much as I do 2D animation because I've just like I said about Emperor's New Groove, wanting to go back in animation after Mulan. Um, I've kind of done that in my career. So I worked on, you know, 
anything that has has had 2D animation recently, I've probably worked on except for Klaus, but um, Space Jam, A New Legacy, Disenchanted just came out mm -hmm. on Disney Plus. I don't love that film, but I enjoyed working <laughs> on it. Um, and um, yeah, I'm working on a Warner Brothers Looney Tune feature right now, which has been a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, you know, that's my happy place is um, just sitting down and being able to draw crazy characters, doing crazy things. It's, you know, what more is there in life? Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so right. much, Tony. It's yeah. been lovely talking to you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>